Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to this week's Telecast. This week, my guests are Richard Tulkhart, co-CEO of Buccaneer Media, and David Michel, co-founder of Federation Entertainment and founder and president of Cottonwood Media. Editor of Television Business International, Richard Middleton, joins me for a new regular feature called Movers and Shakers. And K7 Media's Gertz Lesis looks at the differing approaches to COVID-safe production, including some notable tweaks to some of the world's biggest TV formats. It's all coming up on this week's telecast. This week's show is sponsored by Moore Kingston Smith, the specialist advisors and accountants for TV, film and radio companies. Their dedicated office of over 100 media specialists is based in the heart of Medialand in the West End of London. They understand the TV industry and what keeps TV bosses awake at night. The Moore Kingston Smith team works closely with many trade bodies such as APA, WFTV, Animated Women, British Arrows and Pact. They've delivered many high profile industry projects including advice regarding the qualification of British films and preparation of applications to the DCMS, liaising with national authorities and monitoring projects and applications to the Foreign Entertainers Unit, as well as the certification of production costs for film, television, animation and video games productions. As one of the UK's top 20 accounting and advisory firms, Moore Kingston Smith provides a complete service offering to the TV industry including corporate finance, tax structuring, employment service, and efficient personal tax planning. They're also a member firm of Moore Global Network Limited, meaning they're well-placed to support you and your business with any international requirements you may have. To find out more, just search Moore Kingston Smith. So on this week's show, I'm delighted to welcome two senior TV executives working in the international drama space and beyond. Richard Tulkhart is co-CEO of Buccaneer Media, the London-based international content production company he leads with renowned producer Tony Wood. The company's productions include Desi Rascals, the award-winning co-production with Gorinda Chada for Sky, and scripted drama Marcella, which aired to global critical acclaim on ITV and Netflix, and saw Anna Friel winning an Emmy, for her lead performance as Marcella Backland. Season three of Marcella is airing on Netflix Worldwide right now, on ITV in the UK and Ireland shortly. Buccaneer is currently collaborating with a world-class stable of literary and directing talents, including Lars Lundström, Oyston Carlson, Irving Welsh, Elizabeth McNeil and Hans Rosenfeld. And David Michel is co-founder of European Production Powerhouse Federation Entertainment, the production company behind hits such as The Bureau and Baby on Netflix. David is also managing director of its kids division Federation Kids and Family and founder and president of Cottonwood Media, the production subsidiary of Federation Kids and Family. Cottonwood creates, produces and invests in premium talent-driven kids and family content. Based in Paris, with offices in Los Angeles, Toronto and Berlin, Cottonwood's productions include the hit teen drama Find Me in Paris, animated feature Around the World in 80 Days, and preschool series The Ollie and Moon Show and animated comedy Squish. So, welcome to the show, Richard and David. Hello, Richard. Hey there, Justin. Hey there, David. Richard, starting with you, are you missing Can, like I am? Strangely, yes. <laughs> um, I, I I think probably between MIP uh, TV and MIPCOM, I, I must have done at least 40 something of them. I never thought I would hear myself say it, but I am genuinely missing it. The grass is always greener type situation. But then again, I think I could probably travel anywhere right now, even a war zone. <laughs> Just to escape from my office at home. How about you, David? Are you pining for the uh, Riviera? I feel exactly the same way. Before COVID, I was getting into this, ah, uh, yet another MIP, you know, kind of situation you get into after a few years. Yeah. And now 
I'm not only truly missing it, but I'm seeing what was so important about it, which is, you know, obviously human contact, but not just that. Like, I'm, you know, as we're all pitching on Zoom, on Skype, on the phone, instead of, you know, doing it in the flesh, you know, you can really see what's missing from mm. that human contact, crossing all fingers that this is over soon. Yeah. Actually, having that face to face is uh, is so important. Well, you don't you don't ever end up having a surprised Zoom. You know, in in can you do end up having a, a number of moments, whether it's you know in a bar or in a restaurant or just at the stand, where you are introduced to somebody or you meet somebody or they overhear a conversation, and from there springs a new relationship that down the line can mean new business. And I think that's the bit that I I really miss. I think there's a phenomenon (laughs) that only happens in large crowds and at MIP, which is, you know, the good rumor mill. You know, basically at MIP, if you have something cool and you show it to someone, then another network from another country will come to you and say, oh, I heard you were pitching this. And, uh, you know, it gets bigger and bigger and it really gives a lot of you know energy to the pitching and people being interested and that has gone away you know we know pretty well all the buyers we're speaking to and pitching to on zoom right now but it's always one on one so you don't have this and that's i guess what i miss the most you know yeah it's the, it's the opportunity to just to create that organic buzz um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, the the word of mouth actually at the market, and that's you know that's something from in my profession uh, we're always looking to hone and and try and work out how we can really build a buzz throughout the market for uh, clients' projects. Taking that away is makes it just a little bit more uh, linear, if you like, in the way that you can you can pitch. Richard, it's it's a year since it was revealed that you were going to be making the move from A and E Networks to join Buccaneer Media. You joined Tony Wood as co-CEO in January. How's your 2020 been so far? Let's not dwell on the uh, on the, the bad bits of 2020, because I think everybody has their own stories to tell there. But um, we got quite lucky. We recently finished uh, producing Marcello season three for ITV Netflix. We weren't stopped uh, in mid-production, which uh, I know... Uh, many people were, so that was a blessing. You know, we've had uh, crime was picked up by uh, ITV for BritBox. Uh, we had Whistable Pearl picked up for the AMC service Acorn. Then Whistable Pearl goes into production, all fingers and toes crossed, uh, in less than two weeks. Right. Um, and then crime is uh, due to go into production uh, in Edinburgh in March. To uh, banking green lights with uh, big SPOD services um, yet to be announced. So I won't say which ones they are. Um, and we're out with two other shows uh, at the moment, which we'll know about pretty soon. So, you know, in that sense, it's been it's been fantastic. It'd be it would be nice to be able to celebrate those green lights and pick up more. But you just sort of remain forever in a nervous position about getting through production. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting time. Um, we want to expand. We're looking at ways that we can expand, trying to just sort of forget about the bad stuff that's going on around us and, uh, and, and fit into the new environment, which is always changing, always will change. And I'm just I'm, I'm happy to be uh, a smaller company, I would say, at the moment, uh, where you can turn quickly, make decisions quickly and, 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 and plan for the, for the future without having to get permission too many times from different people. And so Crime is Irving Welsh's first ever TV adaptation. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Britbox and uh, you know, ITV have been fantastic supporters uh, of the, the show from the beginning. Irving has written uh, an enormous amount already, you know, in, again, in today's day and age of, of, of COVID, being able to be prepared and as prepared as we will be by the time March comes around is, is fantastic. But uh, yeah, crime is with with Dubre and, and Irvin is a, is a very exciting prospect, and um, looking forward to it. David, how about you? How's Paris at the moment, and and how's production 
uh, working in in France right now for for you guys at Federation? Uh, I, I know that a scheme is now in place in the UK to you know compensate for uh, you know COVID related uh, problems, and this is something that started a few weeks before, a few months before over in France. So it was easier for us to you know restart our shoots. I would say that um, obviously these are more expensive and longer shoots with more you know safeguards all around. I'm one of the producers at Federation and I handle everything kids and family. So what I can tell you is that my colleague, those who do prime time live action, they are now fully functioning and not back to normal, but back to shooting. And it's been going well. There hasn't been any major accident. On my end, we finished season three of Find Me in Paris right before the lockdown. So that was good. We finished editing the show and delivering during lockdown, but that wasn't really affected. As you know, we had a very strict lockdown in France. Yeah. You know, we could only walk out like an hour a day, so really could not go out to work. But still, because half of what we do on the kids and family side is animation, that went on, got slowed down a little bit, but that went on. So our main current production is our first uh, CGI feature film with uh, Studio Canal. It's called Around the World in 80 Days, and it's a slapstick take on that mm. uh, by uh, the author of Ice Age 2. So that got just delayed a little bit during lockdown and we're delivering in the spring. So that's quite exciting. Yeah. And then we used that time of lockdown to develop a lot. <laughs> I, I know a lot of people did, and I, I, but I think we did it in a smart uh, way, very focused way. And as soon as we came out of that period, so that was May in France, we started pitching these new shows and got some great feedback. So we now have one major teen live action show, kind of like Find Me in Paris, that is getting greenlit by a major SVOD and a few major European channels. I can't disclose it just yet because my head would be chopped. <laughs> <laughs> I know that one only too well, yeah. So this is a co-production. And the other one is a full-on commission by another platform, US. And we're on the, the verge of being relit. So, you know, that time off was extremely helpful for us. So we started the company six years ago. We're a very entrepreneurial company. And... You know, when you start a new production company the first few months, you can really focus on your development. And that's fresh and exciting. And then you get commissioned and then problems start to pile up. And your mind isn't as free as it used to be to develop. So that lockdown period, for us at least, was a real breath of fresh air. It put us back into that, you know, starting a new company, let's develop type of state of mind. You, you mentioned Find Me in Paris. Who are the broadcast partners for that? So the show uh, is co-produced with ZDF, ZDF Enterprises and Hulu, um, as well as Disney France. And then it's sold pretty much everywhere. But the founding partners of the show really are ZDF, ZDF Enterprises and Hulu. Who they're the ones who really believed in the show, and it's it's kind of a, a strange animal this show because it's a, we kind of created a new category with it, mm. which is premium international uh, drama for kids and family, and it's a small, very very small niche because basically you have your domestic drama in Europe and it's great and the budgets are lower. Then you have your U.S. dramas that have a very high price point, and we're kind of in the middle. So the, the budget for Find Me in Paris was, I, I think, about like 13, 14 million euros for 26 half hours. Mm. So, you know, the cost per half hours is not that high if, if you compare it to the U.S., but for, you know, a younger show, it's it's really good. And 
it's interesting. That worked really well. No one was doing that kind of show, so we saw a lot of demand for it. Mm. And that's why we, you know, we developed more during lockdown. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Richard, you've also been working in the podcast space. Tony Wood, my business partner, uh, and Michael Epstein have produced a documentary called Murder in House 2. Uh, this followed uh, a massacre in Haditha uh, in Iraq by uh, a group of U.S. Marines and uh, the subsequent court case, which was the biggest war court case in history in the U.S. And Michael Epstein really followed this from start to finish. Uh, there's far too much to say about it on, uh, on the time that we, we've got. But uh, there was far more footage and story that, that, than could be told in a single documentary. And so the idea came to do a podcast um, that you know, we hoped that might in the end lead to um, the story being picked up and us being able to make it into a, uh, a limited series drama. The podcast only recently been released. I think it was episode four went out um, uh, this week. Uh, it's the number one crime podcast on Apple, so far exceeding our expectations as to, to how it would do. But I think we've just been more and more interested in that space for storytelling. Murder in House 2 was one of those stories that is very intricate, a lot of complicated legal matters, um, dealing with, you know, what was a, a horrific uh, massacre of women and children uh, in a complicated time. And those sorts of stories, you know, they, they, they're not quickly and easily told because you're dealing with human error, cover-up, uh, geopolitics, you know, each one of those things can uh, can take up a series on its own. We'll see how it, it, it keeps doing, but it's one of those stories that once you've listened to one episode, you just have to know what happened. So I think, you know, the podcast space for us um, after this experience is something we'll, we'll certainly be looking to, to do more of. I think the escort services in particular have an enormous amount on their desks. And so it becomes what lifts a show above the other shows that are on their desk because there's bound to be an enormous amount of very, very high quality uh, scripts and, and, and ideas. And um, I think packaging with talent is, is going to be key in the next sort of 12 to 18 months as, uh, as we carry on through, through this crisis and understand how to work within it. How have you found that commissioners have been approaching scripted projects over the summer, over the last sort of six months or so? Uh, because obviously, you know, up to that point of COVID happening, then, you know, everybody was talking about the golden age of drama, the golden age of scripted. So um, it seemed like there was a almost like an arms race, a, you know, a real rush for for this scripted content. And obviously what we've also seen since the beginning of the pandemic is all of these new SFODs launching, big American SFODs like HBO Max and Peacock and, you know, the existing Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu, all of these buyers. There seems to be more buyers than ever. But obviously the production pipeline has closed or was closed for a certain amount of time. So how have you found drama committees? Are they saying, we love this project, but we can't commit right now. We have to wait until we see what's happening with the business. Or are they taking more risk and saying, yes, we've got to have this now? Um, first of all, David, how are, you, how are you finding it? In a nutshell, I think there's no way to say at this point because everything is kind of artificially uh, bolstered. Um, if you look at the public channels over in Europe, uh, at least, uh, you know, their mandate is to make sure that our industry doesn't crash. So they keep uh, commissioning. If you look at the platforms, you know, they're in a very high growth curve uh, and they're all looking for uh, content right now. So they're commissioning quite a bit. The only channels that might be commissioning less directly because of COVID are the you know purely private linear channels but again i i think this is quite artificial because there there's an intentional will to support the production industry and that's great 
And you have this in the UK, we have this in France, they have it in Canada, for instance. They don't really have it in the US, but again, the platforms are here to kind of keep ordering. Um, so this is all great, but this is transitory. And to me, the question really is, what's going to happen in six to eight months to a year if the economy keeps degrading, i.e. if people um, you know, maybe start cutting down on their uh, SVOD subscriptions, which is something that hasn't really happened yet. What happens when all that you know, comes out? And we still have to wait at least half a year to know where it's going. And I don't want to be a pessimist, but I'm just thinking that my direct impression right now as a producer is that everything is fine and that people keep ordering. But as I think about it, I really believe it's a transition phase and we haven't seen much of what's to come. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Richard? How have you, uh, how have you found it over the last few months? It's more upbeat. I think the odds race has really <laughs> just begun. <laughs> I think you know, if you go back to when this kicked off, I think there was initially blind panic of, oh my God, there's not going to be enough shows for our channels. Uh, and so you saw, you know, a number of deals like say for Tehran, bought by Apple, a, a show that was ready-made and it was uh, of a high quality and uh, they uh, rightly jumped on it. But that was the initial phase so i think it's sort of gone in, in in stages and phase one was we need to protect ourselves and there were deals like that that were going on um the next phase i think came through that was uh, a sort of a, a look at what we have currently sitting with us because i think they already had quite a lot and so you're seeing that those are now starting to come through those are starting to be announced and they're starting as well, obviously, to pick up other shows. And those are going to be focused on. So I think the panic sort of scenario has gone. And now everybody's really drilling down into what, what is going to cut through uh, and work. And I think whether it's uh, the, the linear players or the SVOD players, their, their thought processes are slightly different. Yes, they want to support the, uh, the production community because without the production community, uh, really, what have they they got? You know I mean, however big they may be, they may, they won't. The platforms, particularly, won't just won't be able to produce the shows themselves for the, the platforms. Not necessarily that they couldn't do the volume, although I don't think they could. But they won't get the the different tastes and flavors that the independent world provides. Yeah. So I I am upbeat that we're going into a, a period of time. Uh, where we've got a plethora of uh, people to sell to. My only reservations on the whole thing is, are we actually allowed to produce and can we get through productions without them being stopped if we're in this stop-start world of shutdown, not shutdown? Um, that's where my concern lies, not with uh, the appetite and the need for drama. So you don't think that there will be piles and piles of scripts on commissioners' desks. You know, there won't be a backlog. There is at the moment. There's no doubt about that. Um, and I think the benchmark is has been set to a new level. And that's no bad thing. I think as an industry over the last 10 years, we have we keep resetting benchmarks and uh, and, and and new levels of, of production that we have to achieve. And as a result, the audience which is, you know, they're, they're, they're our clients at the end of the day, and, and the audiences are dictating that they require seeing a higher and higher standard of, of, of television. And I don't think that necessarily translates to higher and higher budget. And obviously co-productions and, and that's sort of financing to higher-end drama projects is, is, is being crucial. Do you see that becoming more crucial in terms of drama production as we go forward, David? Yeah, and it's a different genre of co-production. Uh, I think, you know, up until a few years ago, a co-production was almost, uh, um, you know, a bad word, especially in the UK, to be honest. <laughs> uh, and it was, it was a little, you know, a little dirty. Uh, it was something you had to do uh, for financing purposes. 
uh, I think there's a new genre of co-production. I think our, our audiences are really becoming global. So what, what we're seeing, for instance, with our shows, which is, you know, you have a platform um, like Hulu or, you know, a, a, another local SVOD co-producing with a few networks. That's really interesting. That does not affect the creative. And it really brings much more financing to your show. And as, as Richard was mentioning, it helps you get to this new level of expectation in terms of production value. So uh, I think this new type of co-production is here to stay. Uh, I think there's also, uh, you know, your typical large public channel uh, Euro co-productions. And these are actually doing quite well with the same notion that it's not just to produce something cheaper with smaller you know, pockets of, of funding. It's actually to produce something more expensive. And uh, that makes me think of Around the World in 80 Days, the live action series mm -hmm. that's produced by our, our colleagues are uh, at Federation with Slim in the UK. You know, there, there's a UK network. There's France TV uh, over in France. And uh, a, a couple of other commissioners, and this really helps produce something uh, at a budget level that's really hard to get to, except if you're doing something that's fully commissioned by a platform. So I think it's interesting. I think co-production is really having a, a rebirth, a long due rebirth. Richard, you've, uh, you're an expert in pulling together um partners from all around the world on on projects are you uh, are you are you looking at co-production being a really key component for drama production going forward sometimes people throw around the term co-production in a sort of loose way and where actually what it is is a a lead commissioner and some sort of hybrid pre-sales i think that's a very important model the the out and out Co-production that David was referring to there with the, with the 80 days around the world is a is a fantastic thing to pull together. I just think that to do that is it is rarer than people think, and it really comes down to the creative um, and fitting the story into the business rather than the business driving the story, because I think that's where you end up with a weaker show. And for me, the story and the creative has to drive the business. And if you have that in place, then I'm pretty certain that, you know, we can put that together somehow, some way. And uh, that, I think, is going to be important, uh, you know, in the, in the coming years. So it's really looking for those stories that allow for these models. And now it's that time of the show where we get to discuss our guests' stories of the week. David, what's your story of the week? So the story that struck me the most this week was... Actually, Disney Channel UK closing its linear feed. I think it's a major uh, point uh, in the story of our industries. I think it's the first one and definitely not the last one. We all know that we'll be transitioning slowly to nonlinear. So it can be SVOD, it can be catch up television, it can be VOD, but the first country. Uh, you know, in, in Europe that's actually doing this is the UK channel that were very strong. Disney Channel UK was no strong player. They just closed down and moved everything to Disney+. Plus. So to me, it says a lot about the future of our industry. And I wasn't even aware of that, you know. When did that happen? So if you go on my Twitter feed, <laughs> I put on a few pictures of, like if you go on Sky today, this scary sign that says Disney Channel doesn't broadcast anymore. This channel is closed. It's fascinating, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, I'm going to do that. And again, you know, we're, we're going to put lots of links in the episode description this week, but I'm going to do that. I'll link to your Twitter feed. We'll have a look. That's extraordinary that we didn't know that. Wow. Okay, well, maybe that's a new story in the in the making there. You know, that's where the world is going. But, you know, things happen in fits and starts not progressively and that's that's a big fit and start <laughs> presumably that will mean the rolling 
off of all of that content from these uh, linear channels onto Disney Plus right across Europe and presumably across the world now. Yes, it's going to happen at some point. You know, it might be six years in some territories, but that's you know that's the trend. That's what matters. Mm, yeah. Well, as you say, sign of the times. Yes, very much so. Richard, what's your story of the week? I, I chose an article where uh, Jane Turton was uh, interviewed um, in relation to the impact of coronavirus and, and, and all three media. And, you know, I think I, I understand why people are doing it, but I also think at a time where many, many people are suffering, when you endlessly hear that, you know, you know and I'm guilty of it as well, everything's fine, it's all going well, we're, everything's no problems here sort of thing. It was quite refreshing to read uh, an article where, she clearly states that the problems of COVID-19 have not been felt uh, yet and uh, they are around the corner and they are preparing for them. And for a giant like all three to be saying that, I thought was, um, you know, it was refreshing. I was, uh, I read it feeling as though to hear that there are, there are headwinds coming, but, uh, you know, we're all, we're all in this, in this together and everyone is going to feel them in some way or other. It was an article that I hadn't read from, from any other big company in, in the way that it was written. So that's why I chose it. And that was the story that all three media delivered record-breaking revenues of almost £750 million for 2019. And now they're looking at this year and, uh, and going ahead. And, and the term that they used was significant risk to the business in terms of coronavirus. And obviously, this is a company that's picked up more than 40 SVOD commissions over the last two years. It is, as you say, Richard, refreshing to see a big production group being realistic and you know, saying what I think everybody is aware of, but being maybe being the first to say, you know, this is you know, this is not over yet by a long chore. And now it's that time in the show where we get to hear our guests' nominations for Hero of the Week and who or what they want to tell to get in the bin. David, who's your Hero of the Week? So, so my Hero of the Week are the three uh, women uh, who won the Nobel Prize this week. And uh, for, for two reasons. The first one is obviously they're women in a very male-dominated category. And the second one is that they devised a uh, new technique called CRISPR-Cas9. It's basically basically them opening the door to gene editing. So I find that quite fascinating and exciting. For a layman like me, it sounds frightening, but it's probably something that you know is is going to completely change the way that we live, right, in the coming years. So uh, I'm going to have a read up about that, and uh, and again, we'll put a, uh, a link to that in the episode description. And who or what are you telling to get in the bin, David? Okay, this one really made me laugh. I don't know if you read this piece. There, there's this actor of The Bold and the Beautiful who apparently has a lot of kissing to do on set. And he now has to do all his kissing scenes with a mannequin. And there's this hilarious uh, news piece on CNN where, you know, you see this guy pretending he's, you know, kissing a woman on the lips and it's actually a plastic mannequin. and He does it over and over. It's the funniest thing. And, it, you know, it's funny and obviously it's very telling about the times we live in. <laughs> so that's my bin. <laughs> yes. No, absolutely. Well, I think we can all we can all agree with that and put that in the bin. I'm not going to think about that too much more. Yeah, makes me feel a bit queasy. Richard, who's your hero of the week? The fly that landed on Pence's head and sat there for two minutes. <laughs> it just made for brilliant television we all know what flies like to land on and fly around um and whilst he's sitting there talking about the fact that there is no such thing as systematic racism it's just brilliant i just felt sorry that the fly had pence on his stomach for a couple of minutes yeah <laughs> absolutely well, well uh yes the, the fly the fly well maybe we can get the fly on the show and a coming uh coming episode but i, I, I understand he's fully booked yeah fully booked. yeah i'm sure he's got some insights that he can share and he's obviously the world's most intelligent fly and uh and who or what are you telling to get in the bin richard 
I just got to be pants, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Following up from the fly. Um, but yeah, he can he can just hop in a bit. But, uh, the fly can head off into the sunset. Yes, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, uh, David, Richard, thank you so much for joining me this week. It's been uh, really interesting to hear about kids production podcasts and and obviously drama production as well and uh, your experiences over the last few months and uh, looking ahead to uh, hopefully post-covid days we can we can think about and dream about and hopefully uh, in the not too distant future so thank you so much for your time yeah, thank you, Justin. i look forward to seeing you very soon in real life thank you well now it's time for a new regular feature on the show called movers and shakers where every month we'll hook up with editor of Television Business International, Richard Middleton, to run through the latest big executive moves in the TV industry. Hi, Richard. Happy MIPCON week. Hi, Justin. Very nice to to virtually be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, it's great to have you back on the show. It's been a few few months, really, since your last uh, appearance. How's things going over at TBI Towers? Yeah, it's that sort of uh, normally extremely busy part of the year, isn't it? It's It's been fairly frenetic. We were all kind of waiting to see what would happen with, with MIPCOM going online and MIPCOM Online Plus. Um, but we've certainly, we're in the midst of a really busy week. We've been inundated with releases about new product and distributors. Um, we've seen lots of uh, lots of yeah press releases coming into into TVI, and, and we've been trying to cover all of those developments uh, at tvivision.com, of course, as well. Um, we're, we're also launching our new TVI Buyer's Guide, this week, which is very exciting, uh, it's a brand new initiative, uh, and it's basically designed to it's basically designed to fill a bit of a gap in the market that we've noticed by uh, tapping into our long-established international community of readers uh, and connecting those those global buyers and, um, and others in the industry um, with a carefully curated collection of programming from distributors all over the world. Um, so it's a really beautifully designed uh, online magazine. You can go to tbi tbivision.com uh, and check it out. Um, and each entry has a has a, a show. Uh, includes artwork, description of uh, of the show, uh, a synopsis. Uh, there's links to trailers, a whole host of information, and distributor contacts, of course, as well. Um, so this week, yeah, we're we're rolling out the first monthly instalment of that. So it's been an extremely busy week. It's been an extremely busy month, to be honest. Um, with with yeah, MIPCOM Online Plus this week, we've had the Mag Go a couple of weeks back. Um, so the October November magazine is out there. Uh, and now, yeah, the launch of uh, the Buyer's Guide as well. So we're uh, all hands to the pump at the moment. Yeah, it sounds like it. You have been busy. Well, uh, well, good luck uh, good luck with that. Now, we're seeing a lot of high-profile executive changes in the world of TV right now. And there's probably none bigger than those at Netflix. Indeed. It has been, yeah, it's been a fascinating uh, month, six weeks or so in the world of uh, the the senior TV execs and where they might move to next. Um, as you say, Netflix has been at the, at the sort of centre of, of some of the changes. Um, this week, of course, we had Channing Dungy leaving Netflix. So she was Netflix's VP of Originals, um, and she'd only been in the role two years. So it came as something of a surprise. Uh, she joined in December 2018 from ABC, where she was president of entertainment. Um, and she'd been there for, I think, 14, 15 years before that. But she left ABC to come to Netflix to work with Cindy Holland, um, who, of course, has also subsequently left. Um, we can talk perhaps more about that uh, in a bit. Um, the interesting thing about Dungy, so she she worked with some of Netflix's biggest overall deals. So she was working with the likes of Shonda Rhimes, Kenya Barris, uh, Genji Ko, and all sorts, um, Obama, the Obama's Higher Ground Productions. Uh, mm. she, she was quite a key figure there. She's The, the rumours are that she's... One, which is a front runner for the Warner Bros. Uh, TV job, which has been uh, uh, come up recently. So this is an interesting sort of uh, combination of, of uh, streamer and US studio and changes um, affecting both companies. Yeah, and and she's the latest, as you, you mentioned, the latest big exec change since Ted Sarandos took over as co CEO. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. So we had uh, we had Ted Sarandos uh, up to earlier in the year, and now uh, and now we've seen Dungy leave. As I said, so Dungy used to he was brought in by Cindy Holland. Uh, Cindy Holland was one of Sar- uh, Ted Sarandos's first hires. Um, I think it was back in the early two thousand two thousand and two, uh, back when it was still just a DVD by mail company. So she'd been mm. there for ages. She left uh, a couple of months back. 
Um, and she was replaced by uh, Bella Bajaria. Um, so she, Bajaria was VP of Local Language Originals. Um, and then she had her, uh, her role increased. Uh, and Holland was, well, she left, uh, I think it was on good terms, but yeah, she was a casualty of that sort of reorganization. Um, and then Dungi is now left as well. The interesting thing about Dungi is so there's been a, a long running, uh, well, fairly long running um, free position at Warner Bros. TV. That came, uh, that was basically that position uh, was held by Rovner, who's gone to NBC Universal, which has completely restructured its, uh, its operations to focus on streaming. So Rovner is uh, over at NBC Universal. That freed up the position at Warner Bros. TV. Uh, for a new president, uh, and now Dungi seems to be in the running for that. She hasn't commented. There's been no confirmation that she's definitely going there, but but certainly the rumours we're hearing are that she's uh, she's definitely in the running for that position. And I, I think she came to the centre of attention during the whole Roseanne Barr cancellation Ferrari when she was at ABC. So uh, it'll be interesting to see where she uh, she ends up. And and there's been, as you say, lots of big moves recently. And also on the media merry-go-round, it's all changed at Fremantle. It is indeed, yeah. Fremantle, uh, this is another one of those, yeah, merry-go-round, you can say. It's a bit of a, a domino effect. Um, so we, we saw uh, just this week that Fremantle uh, had named, well, it promoted Christian Vesper uh, to become its president of global drama. Um, so Christian, I'm sure everyone listening uh, who will be well aware of Christian Vesper, uh, well known in the, the international scripted world, uh, so he's going to be replacing Sarah Duell um, and reporting into Andreas Grossati, who's the group CEO uh, over at Fremantle, and, and he looks after all of their scripted activities uh, across drama and film. Vespa is taking over, as I say, from Sarah Duell. Uh, Sarah Duell has recently been hired by Studio Canal um, to take up the position that Studio Canal's uh, Nicola Schindler used to hold. Nicola Schindler now moved to ITV Studios. So it is quite a uh, one move uh, often in TV uh, means that there will be subsequent moves down the line. Um, yeah. yeah, Vespa, uh, is, I mean, he was most recently EVP and creative director um, of Global Drama. So it's not a huge change for him, but it's, it's certainly a nice bump. Um, he's been there at Fremantle since 2016, so he knows the ropes. Um, and before that, of course, he was at Sundance TV. So he's known for shows like Top of the Lake, The Honourable Woman. Uh, he was deeply involved with Deutschland 83 as well. So he's got a really interesting remit at Fremantle. And I mean, Fremantle have got some really interesting producers, The Apartment, Wildside. Uh, there's the North American division and Houston Films, to name but four. So uh, expect to see him uh, busy uh, in the coming months. Lots of moves there. And, uh, and also, it's all changed at BritBox as well. It is, yeah. This one was, it, it was a bit, a bit of a shock. Uh, so Sonia Shruman, who um, was president and CEO for, for North America um, at BritBox. So worth remembering, just sort of BritBox, there's a UK version, there's an Australian version that's just launched, and there was, the original really was the North American version. Um, it's backed by BBC Studios and ITV Studios. So it's a, it's a joint venture between the two companies. And, and Sonia was, she was, I mean, she'd been a key sort of exec at the streamer. She joined in 2017. Uh, she previously was, she worked in franchise and, and digital uh, division at BBC Worldwide North America. So she was kind of part of the family um, within, within BBC Studios. Um, but yeah, she's, she will be leaving at the end of the month and this new leadership is to be announced uh, in the coming weeks. The interesting timing element of this story is that it's because BritBox had just announced that they've actually got uh, 1.5 million subscribers in the US and Canada. So huge achievement for Somia and, and her team and for BritBox in North America, obviously, is mm. a competitive market. She left on a high and, and then she left, leaves quite a legacy as well. She you know, had lots of original, well, quite a few originals. Um, and she also leaves at a time when BritBox's future is... Not to say unclear, but it, they're, they're looking to expand it quite extensively. I mean, when you talk to some BBC Studios execs, it, you know, the impression is that BritBox is, you know, it will go into certain territories where where BBC Studios might not have any other any other interest. But ITV mm. Studios seems to be a, have a slightly different uh, take on it. They announced a, a couple of months back they were looking at twenty five territories. Uh, I think the Nordics among them and a few others. 
So it will be interesting to see who they bring in to replace uh, Somnia at North America, because obviously it's one of the flagship uh, sort of divisions for, for, for BritBox. We've got the Australian uh, BritBox streamer. Uh, they recently hired former Network 10 exec Moira Hogan, um, and she's just had her budget upped for ori- basically to spend on originals. Um, so we're all, yeah, we were waiting to kind of find out where Somnia might go. Uh, we've, there's been a few rumours, um, but uh, at, at the moment, there's nothing too concrete of yet. Wherever she goes, she'll uh, she'll be taking a, a pretty impressive CV with her. So uh, good luck to her. And uh, there's also been some distribution changes over at Viacom CBS. There have yet. Yeah. Again, this is a, a, a well, yeah. The US studios have been making huge changes this summer. Uh, we've, we've seen you know, Disney, uh, NBC Universal, and Warner Media. They've, they've all been sort of rejigging their operations, putting uh, streaming at the center, and, and Viacom CBS have been doing a similar thing. These latest changes that we saw uh, affect Viacom CBS International Studios, uh, which has restructured its distribution business, um, basically combining the activities uh, that it was involved with uh, before. They're going to combine uh, Viz, as it's known, with uh, Viacom CBS's international program sales arm. So basically, the international sales program arm had previously finished on uh, focused on, on finished tape and format sales, um, and now it's going to be working together with, with Viacom CBS International Studios. Uh, so we've seen a couple of promotions there. So we've got Viacom heading up the distribution side of uh, Viacom CBS International Studios. It's going to be Lauren Marriott. She becomes SVP of Sales and Business Operations, and she's going to be the distribution lead for the UK. Uh, and then we've got Laura Burrell, who will become VP of International Formats. Marriott's reporting into Pierre Luigi Gazzolo. Um, so he's the well known exec. He's uh, president of studios and streaming at VCNI, which is the uh, international division of Viacom CBS, and also Aaron Tyndall, who's the chief commercial officer. Burrell reports into Kate Laffey. Many of you might know Kate. She's the former Cineflix rights um, exec who was appointed VP of Viacom CBS International Studios in August. So it's all change. And it's all basically to do with trying to make distribution more straightforward, uh, trying to streamline operations and then kind of going back up to the top. And, you know, we, we saw Chang Dungy leave. We saw Chang Dungy leave Netflix um, and Cindy Holland leave Netflix. And that was part of streamlining, trying to make... Th- the, the structure is more straightforward, um, and we've got a similar sort of situation, I think, probably here at, at Viacom CBS, trying to uh, yeah make make the the divisions as efficient and as effective as possible. There's one thing for sure. I think over this this winter, we're going to see a lot more changes, a lot more uh, rationalisation potentially, and a lot more movement. And as you say, you know, one person, one key person moves. So whether it's at a network or a distribution business, it affects a whole chain of people within the industry. So, we're looking forward to catching up with you, Richard, every month to uh, take us through that on Movers and Shakers. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. All right. Thanks, Richard. Have a great rest of MIPCOM and we'll speak to you soon. Thanks very much, Justin. Cheers. And once again, it's time to go over to Riga to speak to Gertz Lesis from K7 Media. How are you this week, Gertz? Well, I, I, I'm okay, Justin. Just a bit nostalgic about Khan, obviously, <laughs> where I would normally be at this time of the year. Well, exactly. You know, I've been thinking that right now, whilst we're recording this, I would probably be either in Cafe Roma overseeing a, a client interview with one of the trade press, or it might be at a photo call in front of the Gar Mara team. Yeah, I I have to admit I'm really missing it. It's like a love and hate thing. Usually you you love the first days and then you <laughs> hate the last days. Yeah. Uh, but then after a few months you want to love it again. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But uh, but yeah, I mean just the thought of of being on the Quasar, seeing all these people that we've missed at MIP TV, right? That we haven't seen for for a year. You know, all these friends and colleagues in the industry. It's very strange, but yes, I am. I'm pining. I'm pining for Can. But there we are. What are we talking about this week, Gert? Uh, well, I know we have been talking about different COVID protocols and solutions before, but since the situation is constantly changing and the productions are increasingly finding new creative ways to adapt to the current circumstances, I thought that today I could give you kind of a compilation of our findings at K7 
what we see as some of the most common ways to solve the problems arising from distancing restrictions, particularly in production of studio shows. And I mean, on top of the usual testing isolation employed by the majority of shows all around the world. Okay, sounds great. Go ahead. One of the ways used in many countries is employing past footage of audience shots. In Russia, for instance, episodes of The Masked Singer were filmed without a live studio audience. However, an audience was added at the editing stage using footage from previous episodes. In Sweden, producers of a sing-along show went even further in order to achieve maximum authentic feel. They had all participants record only those songs which had already been performed by someone else in previous seasons. And in such way, they were able to cut to materials from previous seasons to replicate the feeling of the audience actually singing along. And another solution is Zoom and live streaming. Australian version of The Voice uh, used a redesigned set with two of the coaches uh, who were unable to be physically present, beamed into the studio via real-time satellite link. And in Israel, super big LED screens were built into the set for the Big Brother final. All screens were then filled with a large number of small screens with people using Zoom or uh, FaceTime to create a feeling that an audience was present. And another Swedish sing-along show used an app allowing viewers to film themselves at home, acting as a live stream virtual audience. The method number three would be audience soundtrack. In a Dutch studio quiz show, the host had a special hand-controlled pad via which he could control audience reaction, playing audio uh, such as laughter or, or applause at appropriate moments. In production of The Voice of Mongolia, a soundboard for clapping effects was positioned next to the coaches and large screens projected the selection of 20 to 25 viewers via Zoom. And of course, the audience soundtrack approach is something we also see widely used in sports broadcasting. Mm -hmm. Another way used by many productions involves audience replacements and changing the setup. In France's adaptation of Don't Forget the Lyrics, for instance, as many probably have heard already, the presenter was joined by a cast of puppets in place of a studio audience. In a German stand-up comedy show, although the comic routines were presented via video conferencing tools, an in-studio host coordinated the show, while mannequins with tablets for heads replaced the studio audience. In German version of The Voice, with only about a third of audience seats filled, viewers are encouraged to send in photos of themselves so they can kind of sit in the empty audience seats. The network is even providing information in advance to those participating as the virtual audience members about image detail, closing light and positioning. And in UK, Strictly Come Dancing this fall is going to overcome the audience issue by seating audiences around tables in a cabaret-style setup. Mm. The next cluster of solutions could be defined as staggering contestants, bubbles, and camera angling. In Australian version of The Chase, for example, the four players are staggered behind the panel, ensuring they could still work as a team whilst group shots were possible. In Denmark, another trick was used to maintain distancing, moving the host back away from contestants in order to use the depth distance as invisible space. In UK, uh, the potential winners of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire won't be able to receive the host's congratulatory handshake for as long as the pandemic continues. Meanwhile, the entire cast and crew of the Great British Bake Off were quarantined in an Essex hotel for the run-up of the shoot, and even practice kitchens were built for the bakers to practice on their days off. And by the way, Bake Off's premiere turned out record-breaking with consolidated audience of 10.8 million viewers and a 38.3% share, making it the biggest channel for broadcast since 1985. Mm. And it also became the highest rated program for young viewers on any UK channel this year with a consolidated, can you believe it, 61.4 share wow. of 16 to 34 year olds. Wow. And they still, it still, you know, defies logic when I think of it. 16 to 34 year olds watching baking shows. <laughs> yes, exactly. And finally, UK's hat trick in August announced something we could define as separate screening rooms. Uh, they said they were working on a 
two studio solution for panel shows, proposing to beam in live audience reaction from a socially distanced screening room separated from the studio panel. So these examples list only some of the most common adjustments, of course, while each individual case is different. And even adaptations of uh, classic, strictly formatted shows accept the importance of flexible approach depending on local circumstances. Take the Indian version of the iconic Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, for example, where the producers have made a decision to drop the audience vote lifeline at all for now and have also decreased the number of fastest finger players from 10 to 8. Well, there's some f- fascinating solutions there to some of these, you know, these production issues. On a slightly different note, what do you see as the new hot formats coming this fall? I think it's the shows that perhaps may be emerging with the current restrictions in mind, but which bring fresh ideas and come with creative solutions strong enough on their own right, so that they can make viewers forget about the COVID background. And once the pandemic is over, these formats could still fly without anyone remembering that they had been created with COVID restrictions in mind. And one example of of such formats, I think maybe Nine Windows, for instance, a new comedy game show talent contest developed in partnership between Japanese Nippon TV and the Story Lab. Presented by a comedy host, the format is featuring nine ordinary contestants beamed into a studio from their homes through nine different windows, giant studio screens, and impressing the studio judges with their hidden talents from balancing household objects on top of one another to using knife skills to slice them into any shape. I think an idea like this applies as much to the current social networking and TikTok-like short-form creativity trend as it suits the COVID environment. Or the Benedict's new dating reality launching online on TV to play in Denmark called Alone Together, in which eight single people are placed into pairs and isolated across four islands where the couples uh, must complete tasks to the best of their ability to ensure they know each other really well and perhaps they will also fall in love in the process too. A lot of these formats that, that you're talking about sound a little bit like an extension of Got Talent. You know, it's about simple, basic human skills and instincts reflected on screen. Well, another Danish format, uh, Real Men, for instance, um, which was originally following a group of men trying to get back in shape, has now stepped up on Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, so to speak. In the new season, the wives want their husbands to go further in their lifestyle transformation journey and expand their cultural horizons by sending them on a trip to learn about ballet, theater, painting, singing, and food. So there is something for every taste. It's going to be interesting, isn't it, as we go into winter now and and as as it looks like ever stricter lockdowns are going to be imposed on us, certainly regionally, but maybe nationwide in 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 many territories around the world then you know we're going to see more and more of these formats produced under these covid restrictions coming onto screen and and i think we have we i think we've probably seen now that you know what we don't want is you know something that is too obviously produced within covid but also reflects the restrictions that we're all under yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's again, another uh, dimension where we want this escapism, in this case, from the, the, the situation we are kind of trapped in. Yeah, we want escapism, but, you know, but still we want we want a bit of reality in there as well, I think. Yeah, true. Gertz, fantastic. Thank you so much. Great to speak with you again. Well, we've reached the end of another week's telecast. Thanks, as always, for listening. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to the show and share it with friends and colleagues. This week's telecast was sponsored by Moore Kingston Smith. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers. Next week, I'm going to be joined by President of Access Entertainment and former Director of BBC Television, Danny Cohen, and Val Cazalet, partner of media specialists, Moore Kingston Smith. So... Until then, as always, stay safe.